I think we're going to get started. I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Christopher Slator um, as our grand round speaker today. Dr. Slator is visiting us from Portland, um, Oregon Health and Science University, where he's an associate professor of medicine. He completed his medical school residency, <laughs> chief resident year, and fellowship in pulmonary and critical care at University of Washington in Seattle. And at OHSU, he's primarily at the Portland VA, where he's clinically, he practices as an intensivist. And on the research end, he does uh, work related to patient, physician, communication, and impact on patient outcomes on individuals who are at risk for lung cancer or undergoing screening or have early stage lung cancer, in addition to modeling risk prediction tools for incidental nodule findings. Um, he's funded by a, the VA equivalent of an R01, a merit award, in addition to funds from other small foundations. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Well, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for inviting me out. Um, so, uh, why don't I get started? So, just this is where I work. So, in case you were wondering, I actually do sometimes get to take a tram to work. So, yeah. that's kind of fun. So, I like to show that. Better than George Washington. These are uh, just like conflicts of interest. Um, I don't have any commercial conflicts of interest, but I like to you know, point out who I, that I do work for the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. I've gotten grants from these people. Um, the, the closest I have to a conflict, to a financial conflict of interest, is I was just actually uh, on Monday, I believe, uh, given a grant uh, by our local cancer uh, uh, institute to work with a uh, for-profit company on a machine learning-based uh, nodule prediction software, which shouldn't have too much to do with uh, the talk today. And then I do want to say, I also worked with the American Thoracic Society to lobby CMS to actually pay for lung cancer screening. So. Although I don't get paid for doing lung cancer screening, I asked CMS to get to pay everybody else. And then I didn't have any, this was the uh, official Mount Sinai Department medicine disclosure that I was asked to put in this. And so I always start with, at the end, so in case I run out of time. Um, so I first just wanted to thank some of the, my other uh, research colleagues and the people I've uh, done research with. These are uh, on, the, on the far end is my research team. Um, and then some folks that I work with clinically. And then I showed these two sort of before and after pictures of my children to sort of point out that we've been talking about doing lung cancer screening for a long time now. Um, and so this is what they look like in, uh, they sort of said there was a randomized trial of lung cancer screening. And then this is what they look like now, right? Just sort of show you that like time has passed. And we should have a picture of, of yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I look exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have thought about doing a talk about just sort of CT scans for lung cancer. So, like, CT scans were invented almost the same year I was born. So, I've sort of thought about doing even a longer talk where I could show myself as a baby, right? But no one wants to see that. Um, and then, also, I just wanted to, I'll give you the summary of the talk now. So, again, so if you want to, you know, take off, then you at least heard the bottom line. So, I'll sort of first talk a little bit about just how lung cancer screening actually does reduce lung cancer and overall mortality. Um, I kind of just point out some of the, just briefly, some of the data about that. It's widely recommended by a host of uh, um, alphabet soups, um, but it's not widely in implemented, and so we'll sort of talk about that as well. And the other thing I should say is I'm super happy to be interrupted and get questions. I actually would prefer that, so, um, and I'm totally happy to, you know, sort of go off on tangents if you guys want to and stuff like that, that just depending on what, what you're interested in. So please feel free to ask questions and interrupt. So I think um, I'm not, I guess, uh, uh, I'll just start here. So this was the, uh, the results of the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial um, that were uh, first published in 2000, or first uh, announced in 2010, um, showing that lung cancer screening uh, was, uh, did lead to a reduction in uh, lung cancer and overall mortality. It was then published in 2011, which is coming up on you know, sort of almost a decade now. And just to sort of remind people, or to show people that haven't seen this before, uh, just that screening does reduce lung cancer mortality, right? So in this very large, uh, supposedly the most expensive uh, NCI, or maybe NIH trial ever, I think the last time I heard it was up to like $400 million. Um, um, it was a trial that showed that um, lung cancer screening using low-dose commuted tomography um, had a, uh, uh, did have an absolute, a relative and absolute uh, lung cancer risk mortality reduction, um, and the number needed to screen being about 320. 
to get screened for three years uh, sequentially and to have uh, that mortality difference in about five years or so. And this didn't, for comparison, um, that, uh, again, I, I try not to uh, get into any sort of arguments with other people's cancers because I found that's like a super dumb thing to do. Um, but uh, it turns out that lung cancer screening actually is in the same ballpark as, if not better, than most of the other cancer uh, screening uh, modalities that we use. So comparative to uh, breast cancer, uh, where there's uh, a number needed to screen of 60 to 69 year olds of 377, um, um, and PSA screening where you know it may not be effective at all, and then sigmoidoscopy where there's a, a colorectal cancer mortality number needed to screen about 871. As far as there's still not a, a colonoscopy uh, uh, randomized controlled trial for uh, colorectal cancer either. And of these, type, lung cancer screening is really the only one that's been sort of have a significant difference in terms of overall mortality as well, with a number needed to screen of about 200. So I think we have pretty good data evidence that you know it actually works. And so as uh, when I uh, not too long after I moved to uh, Portland. Uh, after I finished fellowship, and actually one reason I moved there was because there was this, uh, there was an evidence-based practice review center there, and they had been sort of uh, contracted with the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force to do this systematic review about uh, lung cancer screening. So I got to work on this systematic review where we you know, went through all the literature, um, found, you know, there were, I think there were five randomized trials at that time, uh, looking at lung cancer screening with the NLSD being the far, far and away the biggest one. So we sort of uh, put all this evidence together and then gave it to the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, who then came up with this statement. So they recommended that, and I'll just read it, the annual screening for lung cancer with low-dose commuted tomography in adults aged 55 to 80 who have a 30-pack year smoking history and currently smoke or quit within the past 15 years. Screening should be discontinued once the individual has not smoked or for 15 years or develops a health problem that significantly limits life expectancy or the ability or willingness to have curative lung surgery. And that was mostly based on the NLST criteria as well. They sort of uh, changed it a little bit. And they released that on December 31st, 2013, which I put that up for a reason. I was wondering, does anybody have any a sense of why they released it that day? They're just hanging around on New Year's Eve, like waiting to <laughs> Yeah, so what, how, it is related to that. I don't, do you know how? Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, uh, Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, um, has a rule in it that if the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force gives something an A or B recommendation, that insurance has to pay for it. Right. And so and they had, you had a calendar year to sort of do that. So by releasing it on December 31st, 2013, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force basically explicitly said, like, we think, you know, we think insurance companies should pay for this in the next year, right, so not wait around. So it was a very explicit, um, they didn't say they didn't like actually, that's not like part of what they said, you know, on their website or something like that. But in the discussions, that was very much a planned thing. Like they really pushed at the very end to get it put out that day so that um, they would be sort of covered by the January 1st, 2015. And then, so I, I put this slide up. So, right, so that's the end, right? So, you know, we do a $400 million randomized control trial. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force says everyone should do it. You know, it's it's game over, right? So, well, so it turns out, so um, in in Portland, we I don't you know, we only have one professional uh, sports team, so everyone is very you know sort of excited, crazy about this one sports team. And in twenty, I think fourteen, maybe thirteen, um, after years of sort of being you know sort of in the bottom of the Western Conference, they were finally starting to do well. So they had made it into the playoffs. Um, they were actually playing the Houston Rockets at that time, sort of pre-James Harden, um, and were up like uh, four games to two um, in the sixth game. And it was, and, and they were uh, down with like 0.9 seconds to go. They were down 96 to 98. And so Damian Lillard gets the ball. He shoots like this, you know, amazing three with no time left to spare, right? And sort of wins the game and sends them into the second round of the playoffs, right? For the first time in you know a hundred, you know, a long, long time. And it was super cool, like the whole, you know, everyone's like jumping around, freaking out, freaking out. Uh, Damien grabs the mic from the announcer, this guy in the back, right? Like takes it from his hand and yells out like Portland's um, nickname, which is Rip City. So he yells that out, right? And the crowd, everybody like, yay, you know, it's like so amazing, you know, like didn't we do a great job? Well, the next day, the next, you know, sort of five games, what happens is then they go and they lose like in, you know, in five, right? 
to the Spurs, right? So just sort of saying that it's probably not, it was great that you were excited to make it out of the first round of the playoffs for the first time in a long time, but maybe that's not actually the goal, right? So I don't know, does, are there any sports fans here? So do you know what the goal in basketball is? It's actually to win this thing, right? right? Like the goal is to win the championship. It's not to win, you know, sort of, you know, like you know, the first round of the playoffs, which again, if you know anything about basketball, it's like, it's like there's more people that make it into the playoffs that don't make it in the playoffs, so it's, it's not exactly. I mean, like, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm, you know, I'm not any good at basketball, don't get me wrong, but like, it's not that hard. And it kind of just you know, shows up here. Again, you're not supposed to put slides that you can't like, actually see, but the point of this is to sort of show that you know, it's been a long time right, since like, anybody in, the, in Portland has actually even like, been in the finals, let alone won the finals. Right? And I looked up the, the, New York, the comparative uh, story for the New York Knicks, and I don't know if any, any I see some groans and grimaces. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks kind of the same, right? So I think the point is, you can't just be happy with sort of, you know, doing the randomized control trial and getting this thing. You actually have to do it, right, out in the real world, right? So I think that's what we're going to sort of focus on for the rest of this talk is sort of what, what are, you know, are we actually doing it in the real world? And then if not, why not? And so I think... We're still sort of learning this, but so far it doesn't seem like we actually are doing lung cancer screening in the real world. So this was a study, I think, from the, uh, the National Health Information Survey, I think is what, where this is from. And they surveyed people in 2010 and 2015 and just asked, you know, did you get lung cancer screening, right? And so they looked at it by, um, this is what to say, high-risk people. So I think this is like never smokers, lower smokers, and high-risk smokers. And you can see that, yes, like we did do more screening, right, in 2015 than we did in 2010, right? So it actually it almost probably doubled, right, to a high relative change. But you can see here that it's not a very much of an absolute change, right? So at least in 2015, um, we weren't actually doing very much screening. You know, so four years after the LSD came out. I'm not going to show data, but the, there's other data that are sort of up to 2017 that sort of shows similar things as well. It doesn't seem like we're actually doing lung cancer screening very much. And so why not? Again, so this is an act, so in, I don't know if in your medical school, but in our medical school, there's a big, this big push to sort of involve the audience and be more active, right? So this is the part where I sort of listen to them. So you guys have to be active in this part. So yeah, everyone has to raise their hand, right, to sort of like answer these questions, okay? So why not? So who wants to say there's not enough data or waiting for another randomized trial? No one? So it's kind of true, right? Like, so people have heard of the Nelson trial. Right, so that was another randomized trial that actually just they just released their results. I don't know, like a month or so ago, right? And so up until then, we had we didn't know it. So that's maybe true. It's not cost effective. We're not getting paid enough, right? So do people think that in the real world, people aren't getting paid enough to do lung cancer screening? I think that's the hurdle. No, no one so far. There were too many harms in the trials, right? So yes, I showed you the benefit, but I didn't I didn't spend any time yet talking about the harms. So do people think there were harms in the trials? And then we don't know if it really works, right? So that's the other one. So, so the rest, so I saw one kind. I saw two half hands, a couple you, nods. There's another one that's not up there. Uh oh. <laughs> oh so that's a, what's, what is that? Well, we're just not used to doing it. Yeah. You know, and we're not like prompted appropriately. So it's just awesome. not on it's our too radar. Hard. With, it's, it's too just hard. Too it's too hard. Yeah. It's a pain. Yeah. The primary goal of this is not convincing. Yeah. yeah. That's true. I think that people aren't fully convinced. It's still like we've been very people with other screening. Like we get to the left and then we get to the PSA. It sort of feels like that a little bit. It's also really hard. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just a. <laughs> yeah. But those the burnings were in the absence of like a, an RCT. So, but what I'm saying was when we were burned before, it was in the absence of having really good. Yeah, we started. Right. 
Yeah. 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 So everyone just said the thousand reasons why it's a planet, right? Yeah. So that's, yeah. 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 So no, I think that's, I mean, I, I sort of thought that was under, we don't know if it really works in the real world, but you're, I think you're right. I'll add a fifth dial, like I can add a fifth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so I wanted to talk more about that. So I think, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but this is, so what you said is what somebody else famous said, right? Like not that long ago. So we actually, so a colleague in my, uh, uh, the Boston, or some Bedford VA, uh, Brenda Wiener and I wrote an editorial um, in chest uh, that sort of said, that framing discussions about CT scan, screen for lung cancer, so that patients see the whole, so just like not the greatest title, but the first line in our uh, quotes are talking about like why about lung cancer screening was it's easier to get into something than to get out of it, which I think is what you're saying, right? So we just like jumped whole hog into, you know, breast cancer and prostate cancer screening and then, you know, sort of like made tons of mistakes before we sort of realized what we were doing. And so I think that's a huge part of it is like it's easier to get into something than to get out of it. Does anybody have a sense of who said that? Yogi Bear. Yogi Bear. Oh, good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Somebody. Somebody even uh, more pithy than Yogi Bear. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. No. <laughs> less pithy than <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Donald Trump's some pithy things. I don't think it's on purpose. So no. So you guys are very close. But it was this man, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, right? So uh, people have heard of him. Uh, sort of uh, the uh, architect uh, of the quote. <laughs> <laughs> so he actually said this, right? About, and he actually was talking about Iraq. Right? Okay. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So I think this is, you know, if even Donald Rumsfeld realizes that it's easier to, you know, go in and, and to get out of it, I think that's, you know, something to pay attention to. And so I think that's actually, that's actually one of the, you know, sort of many aspects of why this is hard. Um, I did want to address some of the, the just briefly, some of the other uh, anth possible answers. So we're waiting for one more study, right? So the Nelson trial, when the U.S. Veterans Services Task Force came out, they were still waiting for the Nelson trial. They actually explicitly asked, like, should we wait for the Nelson trial? Because every, every year, every like, everyone would say, oh, the Nelson's going to come out, it's going to come out, but you know, it wasn't. They actually said, we are not going to wait for them. We want to uh, give our recommendations now. Sort of based on this thing that the, it's, it's a much smaller trial than an LST, right? And they sort of felt in the, in the sort of um, uh, 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 meta-analyses of it, it was very unlikely that and unless Nelson showed a very big harm, it was very unlikely that it was going to show, going to make a difference on the overall sort of estimate of benefit, right? They decided to, to wait. Well, it, yeah. So the study had a different age limit than what you essentially recommend. Right. I can't remember. I don't have to top of my head. I don't. It's like 50. Is 80. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force said that because of some modeling that they were that they did on the side. So they said we will make the decision to recommend screening in general just based on the randomized trials, but we'll kind of make a little bit of uh, maybe tweaks around the edges based on modeling, right? So they look to see like is, should you get it every year, or every other year. Should we start at, you know, age 45? Should it be 40 pack years? They sort of plugged all these different things into the models. And in the models, they still found a similar level of benefit to people up to 80 years old, right? They, they said that and if, you, if you read the actual paper, you know, where they where the modeling people came out, which was in the same issue of Annals of Internal Medicine that the um, recommendations came out in, they're very clear that those, you, those people still have to be in the exact same sort of shape, right, sort of comorbid, you know, in terms of comorbid disease, shape as the people in the NLST, which, so there's not tons of people in that over 75 group, right, who, you know, are still smoking, still would meet all those other criteria, who are still in good enough shape to have surgery. So it's a little less of a sort of a jump or crazy thing than it seems at first glance, but, but it sort of, you know, it was something that was outside the realm of the study. And Nelson has a little bit different criteria to, right, to sort of get in. Um, but I don't, so I don't think we were really waiting for the Nelson study. And again, if we were waiting, now Nelson um, result, released their results at the ISLC in September, I believe, um, that sort of showed a similar uh, sort of mortality reduction, right? So amongst males um, at year 10, there was a, a 0.74, uh, I think this is hazard ratio. So they haven't released their results officially yet, as far as I know. Um, this is just sort of a slide on the ISLC website. So I think this is the hazard ratio, so 0.74. For a 10-year mortality, that's probably odds ratio. So it's probably a 0.74 odds ratio uh, for lung cancer mortality based on their screening algorithm, which was a little bit different than the NLST. Also, they had a year one, a year two, a year four, and then year five CT scan. So a little bit different, but sort of I think showing a similar level of evidence that 
lung cancer screening using CT is, uh, you know, uh, uh, reduces lung cancer mortality. And I asked you if cost mattered, right? So this was a study that they used uh, that came out of the NLST looking at the sort of uh, incremental uh, cost of doing it. And they came up with a cost per life here of about 52000 and a cost per quality of about $81,000, which is well within the ballpark of what, you know, uh, if anything's on the cheaper side of a lot of things we spend for in, in uh, U.S. Uh, uh, medicine. So I think it's not sort of a cost problem. I don't have a slide. And actually, people who, who do lung cancer screening probably get paid pretty well also. So it's not just cost effective at a society level. It's probably cost effective for institutions, actually, as well. Um, which I'm not going to talk about, but we can talk about it. <laughs> and so, and then, were there harms and problems with the screen trials? I think that was the answer, possible answer three, right? So, did we make, did we hurt people even when we were trying not to, when we were, you know, sort of in the confines of, you know, randomized trials? So, as part of that systematic review that we did for the uh, uh, task force, we did a side systematic review just focusing on patient-centered outcomes, right, to sort of see if there was a difference there. And, and overall, there was not really much of a signal of, sort of psychosocial type harms. So there was this very uh, uh, like sort of increased short-term psychological discomfort, mostly just around getting the CAT scan itself. There really was an effect overall on distress, worry, or health-related quality of life, so either good or bad. It was shown that if you had a false positive result, um, so usually a pulmonary nodule, that there was increased short-term distress. But if you had negative results, there was decreased short-term distress. And it was on, the, on the, the sort of scale they used, I would put it in sort of the mild range. So at least it didn't seem like from trials that we were you know, causing lots of psycho psychological harm. Um, there was some thoughts that maybe we were making people smoke more, right? So there's this thought that if you get a CAT scan that shows you don't have lung cancer or you don't have emphysema, that's like a green light to smoke. So that was a, a thing that people were really focused on. So we also did a, 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 a third systematic review, I guess, like sort of looking at those data, um, thinking about it in terms of smoking cessation. And the bottom line, there's not going to go through study, is there was really um, when they did it, besides the, the Nelson uh, people, and, and when they analyzed it in a way you're not supposed to, everybody else didn't really see a, a change in sort of smoking cessation rates between people in screening arms and control arms of the trials as well. So it didn't seem like there was, didn't seem like, unfortunately there wasn't a benefit, it didn't seem like going through lung cancer screening actually helped you quit more, but it didn't, it didn't seem like it was a green light to, quit, to, to keep smoking either. Right? So sort of, I think, reassuring information there. In terms of like procedural complications, again, it's, I wanted to show a slide, but the NLSC reports this kind of strange. They reported it in terms of number of procedural complications, not like patients who had them. But overall, the rate of procedural complications was pretty low in both groups. Right? So again, it, it's a little hard to know how to extrapolate sort of NLST, you know, sort of rigorous randomized trial results to the real world. But overall, we didn't really see a lot of procedural complications. So again, so it doesn't seem like we're waiting for another study doesn't seem like you know there's lots of harms and doesn't seem like it's you know cost wise more than we would sort of think. So what I wanted to study now is you know so does it actually work right? So I think there's a lot of you know uh, uh, there's still a lot of I think uh, uh, need to understand does it actually still work in the real world right? So we know that if you're in a randomized controlled trial and you get you know, uh, uh, you know people who are bugging you to make sure you adhere all the time there's the there's the biases of who gets into randomized controlled trials. Right, we're pretty sure it works there, but I still think we need to know does it work in the real world. And then the other, you know, sort of looming question is how do you get it done, right? So I think that's another thing that really has to be sort of thought about, kind of what we were talking about before. So for the, the next part of the talk, I really want to kind of focus on those two questions. And so I was invited to, just to kind of, I guess, back that up, I was invited to um, uh, go to this uh, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine uh, sort of workshop, which is like a day and a half. A workshop just on you know, sort of people uh, talking about implement it, and they kind of came up with these sort of recommendations and you know sort of uh, sort of setting the framework for the questions we still need to ask. So they said we need to understand the balance of potential benefits and harms of lung cancer screening. Um, we need to monitor outcomes for individual patients at the population level. Define, they wanted to help define and reach eligible populations. There's still a uh, need to determine health system <laughs> needs, infrastructure requirements, and capacity constraints. They wanted to really understand how to facilitate informed and shared decision making. They wanted to coordinate how to understand how to coordinate screening efforts and smoking cessation interventions, and then also to sort of think about how to address health disparities. So I think this is kind of setting the landscape for the kind of research studies that still need to be done in this area. And so 
recently I submitted um, an R01 that um, did not get funded, but we're hopefully going to resubmit it again, sort of focusing on these two questions. So these are the, the sort of long version of the aims, but I'll show you the brief version of the aims, right? So number one, does it work, right? So does it actually work in the real world, right? And then if it does work, what works to implement it, right? So how do we understand from people who have already implemented it and maybe, you know, sort of help those who have not yet? And so one of the things that sort of underlines AIMS 2 is this sort of idea of diffusion of innovation, right? So this is sort of a big concept in implementation science is, you know, sort of what are the factors that kind of get, you know, that help people, you know, actually implement things in the real world. And I think this is kind of where we are, right? So um, I think there's people here, I think there's people in this room actually here, like on the innovator side, right? They're probably, you guys are, you know, sort of over here on the innovator side, like in a lot of ways, sort of the starting one can there's the next phase of the early adopters, right? You know, these people, oh, I, think I want to do this or thing. And then I think now we're in this chasm, right? I think we're in this sort of chasm of lung cancer screening where people just aren't, you know, sort of waiting, right? It's kind of like that guy saying, hmm, looks interesting, but is it for me? And I think most of the rest of the country is really, you know, sort of waiting for that kind of thing, right? And then as we kind of hopefully as we move along, what are those weirdos up to? And then I want my fax machine back, right? So we'll see if we ever get you know, to that, to that sort of level there. Um, and so this was the sort of idea for the study that I have. Again, it'll probably undergo some changes in, in thinking about the next resubmission. Um, but the idea was in AIM-1 to sort of think about the effectiveness of, of lung cancer uh, screening, sort of focusing on lung cancer stage of diagnosis, which has some problems, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then, we, so in this study, we were going to combine data from the VA and then also from a large, uh, network really of, so it's not a system, but a network of mostly clinics around the country, sort of focused in Oregon, uh, but then now they have lots of clinics in this network uh, throughout the country uh, with about three million people, sort of looking to see, you know, um, how often people in these places are actually getting lung cancer screening. And then sort of thinking about the implementation part of it, looking to see it, that these, basically these are kind of the different phases of that diffusion of innovation curve, right? So how many people are actually, you know, getting it out of the total population, once you're sort of fully implemented and then at the end you're maintaining your lung cancer screening program as well. And I'm not gonna to talk too much about the, the bottom half, but sort of focusing on, you know, sort of what are those things that might actually help to implement lung cancer screening? What are the sort of uh, core components of that? And so what do we actually know about effectiveness in the real world? So there's been a lot of uh, studies recently that have come out, um, usually often, you know, sort of single center or a couple centers um, that sort of say we've started lung cancer screening and here are our results, right? So these are just some of the trials or some of the, the studies that have come out recently about that. Um, I was involved in the, the sort of probably the biggest one to date, which was eight VA centers who did a demonstration project um, about lung cancer screening, right? So and we just we published um, sort of our results, what, just basically what we saw, right? Uh, a couple, about a year and a half ago or so. But most of these studies are kind of similar to this one, so that's why I just not picking on this study, just using this one because I think it's uh, one of the more recent ones that came out. So what they often do in these uh, reports is they'll tell you, you know, all the people who had different stages of cancer, right? And so usually they say, okay, like you know, we did screening and we yes, we found people with you know early stage cancer, right? And if you know how uh, lung cancer screening, or lung cancer uh, stage of diagnosis looks for you know sort of in the wild type, right? It's sort of you flip from this, right? So most people screen or you know, sort of found stage one or stage two cancers, or it'd be the opposite if you were just sort of looking at wild type one cancer. They sort of showed that there was a baseline incidence of 2% versus only 1% 1, 1 in the NLSD. And usually most most of the, the sort of tone of these sort of papers congratulate themselves for finding, you know, more lung cancer than the LSD, which I'm, I don't think I'm going to spend a ton of time talking about, but I'm actually very worried about that. To me, that's more, it's, it's at least it's potentially a problem. Um, and then the median survival was three years. So again, sort of, yes, we did better, right, than sort of uh, lung cancer out in the real world. And then they also often have another, you know, sort of table that looks like this. It talks about the procedures, right, like, and sort of saying, yes, like, we also, you know, sort of had a low risk of death within 60 days of procedures. And then they say, like, 1.2%. So, you know, again, sort of uh, the sense, like, oh, yes, we can, we can do lung cancer screening and we find similar results to the NLST. So the problem with that is, as I think a lot of us uh, you know, sort of notice, when you just sort of look at, 
you know, um, uh, who gets diagnosed with different stages of cancer. That's probably, that's not the same. That's probably not a, the, the best or, you know, maybe not an adequate surrogate uh, for actually lung cancer and mortality, right? And so I like to sort of, like, even though I'm a health services researcher, I sort of like to go back to biology, right, to sort of focus on, you know, sort of how lung cancer actually works, right, and how screening might affect this, right? So you start here with an abnormal cell, right? And as we've sort of learned, I think, probably, you know, 20 years ago maybe, I think there was a more thought that all lung cancers were just kind of like this one, right? Just kind of going you know, very fast, right? To sort of cause uh, death pretty quickly. But I think we're sort of finding there's actually a lot more cancers within this you know, sort of biologic area of as well. Right? So we have kind of different flavors of lung cancer. There's some are going to go pretty slow, right? Take a long time to actually cause death. Some are going to be very slow, and so much that you actually die from other causes. And some lung cancers are actually you know, going to you know, uh, halt, right, and not keep growing, right, or even regress, right, and not kill people. And when you only do you know one study, you find that you know you find lung cancer, you're not sure you know, which one of these uh, paths it's going to take. And so what happens is if you do a CAT scan, right? So this, I take this picture. This is like. The other thing, I, this is sort of a side note, but in all the sort of patient education materials about lung cancer screening, it's always some like super happy person, right, who's like, you know, very excited to be worried about getting lung cancer. So that's always, uh, that's a little bit kind of ironic. Um, this person actually looks like the right age. Oftentimes people look like they're you know, way younger than, you know, than what you would think. But, so what I did is put that here. So in this person, right, so this person gets a CAT scan, right, and they've already had a fast growing cancer, so they're probably not going to by that, right? So they're already sort of out of the bar by the time they get, you know, get their CAT scan. All these people, right, are probably, these people who don't have any, you know, whose disease doesn't progress are probably not going to be helped by lung cancer screening. These people, again, they're going to die of something else, right? So even though they have a slow growing cancer, they're going to die of something else. So it's really this sort of group here, this slow growing group, that we want to kind of focus on with lung cancer screening, right? The hard part is you don't really know if that's, um, you know, who that is. And then the other things that can you know, change that are sort of thinking if you're gonna, you know, if you're already very sick, right? So even though you have the same cancer, if you're more likely to die from other causes, right? Then you're really not gonna benefit from lung cancer screening as well. I think that's a little bit getting into your sort of point. I think about you know should 80 year olds be screened as well, right? Because obviously 80 year olds who you know have that much you know history of smoking are you know also very likely to die of other causes as well. So all those kind of things need to factor into, you know, sort of, does lung cancer screen in the real world, like when you're outside of a, a trial where you're going to, you know, sort of purposely look at mortality you know, based around doing it or not doing it, um, you really have to kind of be thinking about. And I think this just shows, again, if you die from other causes at a different stage, you know, maybe then you would benefit differently. So if people have questions about those. Yeah, is there yeah. any indication of um, what proportion of the cancers fall into that optimal group? Yeah, I mean... Slower? That's a good question. I don't know the exact answer to that. So in a lot of the sort of overdiagnosis literature they yeah. sort of talk about, like most of those are sort of uh, what used to be known as bronchial alveolar carcinomas. Yeah. Right? So those are probably ones that are probably you know, very slow, yeah. non-progressive. And I think we've learned a lot right, about how to take better care of those, how to be sort of less aggressive, right? to sort of not just cut them out right away. So we do know that group. I think there's, a, there's probably more that we need to know. Because again, once you start looking for a lung cancer, Right, you're going to start finding it. Right? But based on the like the histology results of the NLST, there was you know, there's been no estimation of you know what roughly Which ones, yeah, yeah what's like the subgroup out of all these people that were yeah. saved that are really so they, there's some of that. I, mean, I don't have that like at the top of my head, but so yeah. they looked. There was just a study that came out I think a yearish ago, maybe even less. I think don't quote me, but I think Paul Pinsky's the lead author. And it looked like, so oftentimes we find like small cell cancers, right, um, which have been, you know, sort of, are, you know, sort of typically thought to be, you know, sort of in this fast growing range. And in that group, it didn't seem like screening helped, right? I can't remember offhand how they did the analysis, so, yeah. so we don't, you know, take that to the bank. But, but their bottom line was, you know, like that, those kind aren't really helped as well. Yeah. When they did a sort of, they looked at the NLST results by um, smoking status, uh, sex, and then histology. It seemed like most of the benefit was having people with adenocarcinomas as well, so maybe not squamous carcinomas as well. So those might be so adenos might be the you know, sort of you know, sort of prototypic cancer that might be in that category as well. But I really think we don't know, right? And it also I think 
again, this, this is a little outside the talk, but this has a huge impact on sort of biomarkers and then sort of prevention and things like that, like actually what we do, right? So now in like sort of late stage cancer, there's tons of sort of manipulation of the immune system, right? To sort of keep, the, you know, to, do you have cancer? Uh, you know, you know the, these drugs don't kill the cancer, they just help the immune system sort of keep it at, at bay, right? And so you can imagine that if there are medications that could change, you know, with the immune system, change this to this, right, or this to this, right, at a certain stage, so that could really change, you know, sort of how we think about it. Right. So I think it's really important to be thinking about this, not just for what we know today, but everyone's sort of thinking about, oh, if we do this biomarker test, right, then maybe we can, you know, sort of detect it early. But maybe we need to do the biomarker test because then there's a treatment we can actually give people. Right? And that would, that'll completely change, you know, sort of the estimates of benefit around lung cancer screening as well. So I think that's why it's an important thing to be thinking about regardless, because we're not going to do another, you know, randomized trial of lung cancer screening, right? And we probably won't even do, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't even know if we do another trial of like a biomarker or something else that's going to come down the road. Because, I mean, they, they spent $400 million on the NIH and the NLST. So, you know, my sense is that's like, that seems like a lot of money, right? Yeah. So it seems like that's going to be unlikely. It's going to be another trial. And so there was a group that I thought did a really interesting analysis um, to sort of look to see, you know, <laughs> again, sort of this concept, do surrogate outcomes matter, right? So is lung cancer sort of, you know, stage a diagnosis? Is that a good surrogate for not dying, right, sort of have a good mortality benefit? And I'll just sort of focus on this side of the curve for now. So what they did is they took the NLST sites, I think in the Akron sort of portion of it, and looked at each site, you know, which proportion had stage one lung cancer and looked at their difference in lung cancer death rates and sort of plotted it here in these uh, circles. And what they found is when you like compared, you know, sort of was uh, the difference in lung cancer deaths associated with the proportion of stage one lung cancer, so it actually wasn't, right? So it's like 2,000.65. So sort of showing that uh, stage of diagnosis is probably not a good surrogate marker for lung cancer mortality, right? So these the studies that sort of, you know, say, oh, yes, we found a lot of early stage lung cancer probably aren't good enough to really sort of, you know, hone in and say, yes, for sure, that uh, that's going to equal a lung cancer mortality reduction as well. So I think we really need to think in observational studies how to do comparative analyses still, right? How to still compare um, who gets screened and who doesn't screen. So that was one of the selling points of this grant. And I think something that we're all going to have to do in this area is find places that are, you know, similar patients, which is a hard part, but similar patients who are getting screened in the real world and similar patients who aren't getting screened in the real world to actually see if there's a change in mortality, not just sort of survival. Okay. And then for less of the time, I wanted to sort of focus on how to make, um, uh, how to actually implement lung cancer screening. So one of the things that's been thought is to change the bar on who gets in, right? So make it... Um, you know, I think you guys, some folks talked about um, the, the sort of uh, reasons to get in, right, are kind of hard to remember. So the, the, everyone else wants to make it harder to, for primary care people, right, you know, to, instead of just saying this is a, but they want to make it uh, to use models to actually make that better. So we'll sort of look at that. So there's been a ton of models that have sort of looked at um, uh, sort of redefining who gets into lung cancer screening. So instead of just sort of age and smoking, and take other things like family history, history of emphysema, things like that. And again, I don't, there's not, I don't want to go through the details of the models, but what they'll sort of point out are these sort of exciting bottom lines. It's 90% fewer patients in the screen. We get 12% more lung cancers, fewer false positives, right? That sort of result. The problem is, is in these models, there's like all kind, uh, every model is different, right? And so, yeah. <laughs> That's why I don't know. You guys can pick which which of these models you like, or you can pick you know which one of these models you like, right? And so the U.S. Program of Services Task Force is actually thinking about this, but I think it's going to be a really hard question to answer. So which model would you actually tell the U.S. Program of Services Task Force to use, right? Or which one would you use in practice? Because you get pretty different results, you know, depending on the model, right? So I don't think that's a very easy question. And I also think, like you said, it actually makes things harder, right, for primary care people. Instead of just sort of saying, oh, look, you're a, you know, a 56-year-old woman, right, so everyone should get, you know, mammography or whatever, right? Like, you, now you have to do math, right, in your office to sort of do that or find some other website to kind of look it up, do all this stuff. So I don't think that makes it, it might make it better, it might make it more efficient, but it's probably not going to make it easier to actually implement. And then the other part of these models that I think is important to remember, and, and you can kind of get back to your question, is... So those models are really going to predict lung cancer risk, 
which also, it turns out, like, lung cancer risk is also a super good uh, surrogate marker for how likely you are to die, right? You know, so it's not surprising to me. And this is kind of a, a, a workshop I worked on uh, to sort of think about how to incorporate comorbid disease into this. And I thought this was a good, this was sort of our theoretic model of how this would work. So as lung can as risks of lung cancer, of getting lung cancer go up, actually the risks of dying and harms go up as well, right? So your risk of harm to screening procedures goes up, your risk of dying of lung cancer goes up, but your ability to undergo treatment goes down, and your risk of dying of non-lung cancer really goes up as well. So this kind of, I think that makes theoretic sense. There was actually, I'm going to skip this one for time, they're going to show us the same thing. There was a study that um, came out of some, uh, a group in uh, um, uh, New Zealand um, that sort of looked at this in the NLST. And just, I'll just sort of have you focus on this line, which is, the difference in lung cancer uh, death reduction, right? And so as people go from, these are tertiles of risk, so the lowest risk to the highest risk, as you go along, actually the, the benefit starts to get lower in this uh, higher risk group as well, right? So again, sort of saying there's maybe there's sort of a, a sweet spot of people who are at moderate risk of lung cancer, but still are more likely to actually die of lung cancer being able to tolerate treatments better as well. So I think just using risk is probably not going to be enough. And it would actually probably overemphasize people who are too sick right, to actually benefit. So then other things that we can do to make the process uh, easier. So make someone else do it, right? So I think there's been a lot of talk about just, you know, like this is what happened with mammography and PSAs is you just tell primary care people to do it, right? And um, for good reasons, like primary care people already feel like they're doing 800,000 things, right? And I think that's true. So just making them do it is probably not the right way. So, and I, I, I point this slide out just because all the people who sort of say you should do lung cancer screening, including, I think, I think you were on this stuff that was finishing, right? So we all said, I think I was on this one too. Uh, and Cap Howell said it on there too. So several people you know, around here. We all said, yeah, everyone should do lung cancer screening, but then you should have like 400 different things like you have to do, right, to make sure, right? So we had, it wasn't 400, it was only, I think, nine, right? But that's a lot of stuff, right, to say, like, okay, you should do this, and then here are these nine, you know, very intricate process level things that you need to do in order to do it well. So that's probably true. I mean, I think that's, I don't think that's wrong to say that these are the things you have to do to make it good, but it makes it hard, right, you know? So I think we have to recognize that, that telling people they have to do all these things is going to be a hurdle. And this is what the, again, like, the point of this is not to go through it, but CMS, if you're going to pay for it, they want you to not only do these things, you have to like document this kind of stuff, right? You know, so like at least we just said do it, and then you know, but CMS says, well, yeah, you got to document it, which are not the same things, like you know, so you know, and, well, they should be the same, things, but they're not. But then it, the CMS probably is, so you got to do it, and then you got to figure out a way in your electronic health record or whatever else to actually document that you did all this kind of stuff if you want to get paid. So you know, not surprisingly, that's a hurdle. And this was just in our VA um, um, program. This was a flow chart we had for how to actually get into lung cancer screening, right? Does anybody think that looks easy? I was told once in a, a basic talk, if anybody has more than like three like uh, arrows, they don't know what they're talking about. I think that's true for health services research as well. When you ever have arrows going back and things like that, you don't know what's going on. So what we did in our uh, study, we just like, said, nope, we're gonna like, we have a nurse, right? So a nurse coordinator kind of runs that. So the, what happens is, is the um, primary care person gets a brief alert that says this person might be interested in lung cancer screening. The primary care person says to their patient, oh, it looks like you might be eligible. Do you want to talk more about it? That person says yes, and the primary care person's done. Right? So then they send pretty much an automatic referral to the nurse coordinator who then does all these kind of steps. Right? So, so that person is an expert in doing the steps and not making a primary care person like you know, all these steps. So, and I think this was a representative quote. I mean, I think that the way you do it now is very good. Because all I need to do is just click a couple of boxes and I'm done with it, right? So that was, I think, primary care people really sort of appreciated that as well. You're killing me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, how did we do? So we, so um, we funded the nurse because one of the reasons we signed up as a as our VA to be in the demonstration project is because we sort of thought lung cancer screening was coming and was a good idea, and it turned out like. If you were in the trial, like or in the, it wasn't a trial, but in the demonstration project, um, the, the national VA would pay for a nurse coordinator, right? And they would pay for 
vendors coordinator for two years. And the way VA funding works, if you get if someone else pays for something for two years, it's yours, right? Then it just sort of shows up in your budget, and no one else ever like asks you again. Yeah, so it just sort of disappeared from anybody who like cared about money, right? So now it's just sort of a thing. So we have this nurse coordinator, right? So we trained as sort of the physicians, and we worked with two as a pulmonary nurse before that. So you know, kind of got you know, all that. I think that was a good. That was sort of a good lesson for us. That I think giving it, you know, giving that job to somebody else might be a good thing. So increasing knowledge, right? So maybe we just need to make primary care people, you know, smarter about uh, lung cancer screening, which I actually not sure, I, I don't think I agree with, but we'll just put that out there. Um, so this was a qualitative study we reported on um, at the, uh, in May, uh, the American Thoracic Society meeting, coming up on the paper soon. And so we talked about um, do primary care people uh, know about lung cancer screening. I think these are just kind of some, some quotes, right? I would be lying if I said I really looked at the studies. I feel confident in the fact that our institution would have never started doing it if the evidence wasn't strong enough, right? So again, I think this, again, sort of like, yeah, I don't know enough about it, but because my institution is doing it, then I trust them that they're going to, like, make a good decision about doing it, right? So I think that's actually more where, you know, probably the world needs to go. It's not educating, you know, sort of individual primary care people. It's really sort of educating the systems they work in and building tools for doing that. Make patients quit smoking more. Right, so maybe that would help, right? So maybe like if, if everyone, because I've heard a lot of um, uh, primary care people and other, and, you know, non-primary care people say, well, that's great that lung cancer screens there, but really, you know, that's like you're looking at the wrong thing, right? Like smoking cessation is really the thing you should be looking at, which I both agree and disagree with, but so we don't want to get into talking too much about that. But I think the idea was if you can make sure that people actually, it's part of the smoking cessation program, that that might be an added bonus, right? An added incentive for primary care people to do it as well. And so this is just sort of a, a list of the different trials that just got funded by the National Cancer Institute to sort of to look at that. So we'll know more in a couple of years about how to do that. Again, I'm not gonna get into the trials, but just sort of saying that this is something that other people are thinking about, of how to make smoking cessation more tightly wound up with lung cancer screening. And then improve shared decision making. So maybe if we just are able to talk better about it, um, talk with our patients more about it, actually get them kind of more involved with sort of thinking about it, maybe that's the way to you know sort of make more people do lung cancer screening. Um, and so these are just some of the steps, right? Again, sort of like the individual steps that the that CMS wanted to do. So actually shared decision making, the sense that we should sort of work with our patients to come up with a decision together, right? It's pretty hard. So they sort of recommend, you know, or require, I guess, that you have these topics. You have to talk about the benefit, you have to talk about the harms, you have to talk about the process, then you have this deliberation, you know, sort of step, and then this shared decision making part you know, when you come together. And all of which is to use a decision aid, none of which have really been sort of well, you know, studied in any sort of, you know, sort of uh, trials or anything like that. So it kind of makes sense, but it's a little bit hard, right? And so these are the kind of things that, you know, people put out there, right? So you have to sort of go through these, one of my uh, colleagues likes to call these like airplane seating charts, right? So these are sort of the airplane seating charts of who is sort of benefited by lung cancer screening compared to you know, the people who you know, don't get it, and then all the harms, right? So it's really trying to go through this at sort of a pretty deep level with patients to try to understand all that, which you know may or may not be an easy thing to do. And so we, uh, this study just came out uh, looking at um, sort of does this actually happen, right, in the real world? And so this was actually a pretty cool study. Like they had access, this, this had access to um, all kinds of audio recordings between patients and clinicians. Right? They, had, they had like thousands of recordings or something like that. And so they listened to them um, to find, first of all, could they find you know conversations between primary care providers and um, uh, uh, patients to undergo lung cancer screens? And so they looked at they they looked at five thousand. This this was from a smaller from a larger a larger sample size. So they had 5,000, you know, sort of studies that they, or uh, uh, conversations that they, you know, sort of listened to. And they only found, like, 14, right? So again, so I think this is another good example that lung cancer screening is not really happening in the real world, right? So that's the first take-home message. And then they looked to see, like, well, how good are these sort of conversations? And so this was sort of the lowest scoring conversation. Because of the smoking history, I know you get a CAT scan of the lungs to make sure there's nothing there. Uh, this is a new benefit now. Insurance companies are paid for it. So the patient says, okay. And the physician says, all right, now we'll just get that set up and we'll move on, right? So is that shared decision-making about lung cancer screening? You know? Maybe, I mean, 
we can get into an argument about if that is or isn't. But it, you know, it certainly wouldn't meet all those like criteria that CMS said to get paid for, right? And so in the average time, they talked about for 59 uh, seconds. There's no loan doctors think they're better, but it turns out they're not. Um, and then their option score was six out of 100, right? So six was sort of this like shared decision making score. And so and the highest was 17 out of 100, right? So I don't know. Does anybody, has anybody ever taken a test? <laughs> right, does 17 out of 100 get you like an A plus, right? Yeah. That's all the right? Yeah, because so <laughs> I have down the other people are taking the test. Yeah, and, uh, I'm taking boards on Monday, so hopefully, yeah, I'm gonna be in like the 17 range, I think. So we'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, so you know, maybe that's actually not sort of happening either. So maybe if we can, you know, develop tools, figure out ways to kind of uh, help those conversations better, then maybe more people would get lung cancer screening. Um, and these are some of the barriers, right, to sort of doing that. So uh, there's competing clinical demands, which I think any if you talk to you know, primary care people for more than like two and a half seconds, you'll realize that there's a ton of other competing clinical demands. Um, certain decision making takes too long. There's less familiarity with lung cancer screening for the clinician and patient. Also, there's clinician discomfort with, with these skills, you know, things like that. So I think there's all these other sort of barriers, right, that we need to understand about you know, sort of actually doing shared decision making well. And so. Uh, Almost through, but I sort of at this point I think I've given you lots of sort of negative information. I was I was told by a colleague that the health services researchers are like the wet blankets of, of research, right? We're always sort of saying like everything that's bad. So I kind of like I like this slide. So I, was, I feel like that sometimes about lung cancer, lung cancer screening. I feel like it's a little fish just being out there. <laughs> So I think this is just you know, to sort of summarize, right? So I think all these things, there's too little information about it, not enough time, it's too complicated, right? So all these things are sort of funneling in to sort of saying uh, how we're not doing screening. So I think really, you know, my point I'm trying to get this grant is actually, you know, to sort of think about how are we going to distill each one of these parts into you know, sort of a, a domain or, or an area that we can actually you know, study, right? And sort of in, in the real world, sort of out of moving outside the trials really sort of tease apart those things in order to, to, to identify um, some ways to help make that better. I do sort of want to end on just one positive sort of clinical note outside research. So this was uh, a group of, of folks uh, sponsored by the American Lung Association, Lung Association and American Thoracic Society. And we just put out a sort of a, a guide to screening. So this can be helpful for people who are sort of considering programs. Um, people, I don't know, were you guys, I don't think you, I don't think you're, you guys were in that. So, but there's you can like sort of add to it, right? So it's I think it's a it's a helpful way to kind of just get distill information out to the people about. So these are sort of uh, guides, information, you know, frequently asked questions, things like that about places that have done lung cancer screening. And the idea that you know if you're sort of thinking about starting up a program, you might use this as a resource, right, to sort of you know, figure out what's going on or how you might sort of address that as well. So I'll end there. Um, so again, hopefully I proved to you that lung cancer screening does reduce lung and lung cancer overall mortality. Um, it's widely recommended, but it's still uh, not widely implemented. I think it's really these two things, right? So the randomized control trials aren't the real world. We still need to understand does it actually work in the real world. And I think we also need to understand that implementing these systems is super hard, right? And so I think we really need to sort of figure out what are the barriers, you know, I guess actually moving beyond what are the barriers and facilitators of implementation, but actually what's worked and what hasn't and how to spread those things that have worked you know, uh, to other places. And how can we use those challenges to understand how to make it better? So I think that's really the goal of where, you know, I'm sort of hoping to move with some of my research teams as well. So with that, I think I will end. Uh, we still have, it looks like, two minutes for other questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So a lot of the time,
and it doesn't matter that you diagnose it later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that that's a very important thing. When you're yeah, I think that's a good point. But the implementation, by the way, for the breast cancer screening took a while. Yeah. Yeah. It seems. I mean, I don't. Uh, it seems like it went faster with less data, you know, ahead of it. But maybe, maybe that's that's maybe that's sort of a you know sort of post hoc. I'm you know I'm a little. What's that? Do you remember the big controversy after because it got implemented without the quality assurance? Yeah. And so John Bailey and Dr. Bailey said it got set back tremendously for having two high doses. Oh yeah, yeah, and I think I mean I think um, what is it? Uh, What's, what's the long rads version of mammography called? Us. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so I think they sort of you know we can hopefully learn uh, from some of the mistakes that were made. Long rads is the long version. Yeah, no, I know. I, know. I, yeah, I actually, you know, I couldn't. You know, yeah. I'm so uh, you know, I'm a I'm a lung doctor, not a not a primary care doctor, so I don't have to think about those things. Yeah. One thing we did in our system, so I think most electronic health records have this sort of means of sort of recording things like that in sort of some structured data way. So we, the VA for you know years and years, you know when people came in, are you a smoker or not a smoker? Right. Which again wasn't good enough. So in our in our centers that did the, the the pilot, we actually had you know sort of a hard stop for everybody coming to primary care clinic that you know sort of it, it was a little bit better than what I'm. And how that sounds, but you know, to sort of ask like basically NLST type questions, right? So, are you, you know, are you a current smoker, and when did you? What's your pack years, right? So, relatively simple. We did base, we didn't. If you were forty, you didn't get asked those questions, so you had to be in the right age group. We excluded some people with sort of, you know, uh, ICD nine diagnosis, like pancreatic cancer, or other sort of things that had obvious, you know, sort of mortality uh, reduction. But that was just doing. We added, I think, two questions maybe to people getting checked in, and that was by far and away the biggest barrier. Right, to getting lung cancer, even though we said like, once if you ask those questions, we'll like we guarantee you we'll do everything else. Right, no one believed us, um, but it really took a ton of sort of working with the clinicians, and actually not the clinicians are fine, like you know because it wasn't them that had to ask these questions; it was their the checker inner people. We worked a ton with those checker inner people to actually do that because they had that same reaction you did. Like we're not doing one more stupid thing that like you know you guys want to do. Sure, that's a huge, yeah, that's a huge hurdle. We should, should probably, that, we should probably actually bring the questions up to the front. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Thanks,